Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. Good afternoon, everybody. With me today is Ginny Roth. She is a volunteer with the Alzheimer's Association. She is volunteering with my chapter, a chapter in my area might be a better term. And she's going to talk to us today, all things Alzheimer's Association, but we're also going to focus a bit on the walk and what it does for the association. And Ginny is working with people who are hopefully going to convince Rotary International, and regular listeners know I'm a Rotarian, to take on the challenge of finding a cure or a survivor of Alzheimer's once we've completed our polio eradication project that we've been working on for like 30 years. So thanks for joining me, Ginny. Tell me all things Alzheimer's Association. I feel like I know a lot since I'm a, a legislative advocate, but yes, I have a feeling there's a lot more to know. Uh, yes, um, and thank you for the work that you do do on, on the advocacy side, because that is you know, one of the things that uh, volunteers can get involved in, as you have, where you can work both at the state and federal level uh, really to push for policies, not just for um, dollars for research. That's a big one. You know, we, we go to Washington, D.C. and ask every year for them to bump up the, uh, the funding for the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and that's really the main uh, funder for research than for a cure. But we have a lot of legislation and a lot of policy initiatives that deal with, you know, things like educating the medical community. Um, you know, uh, getting the right codes put together for, and this sounds really mundane, but it's really important for Medicare so that, you know, we have a way that um, some of these services can be paid for and that the medical community knows that those, um, that, that, that those codes are out there and they can use those because that helps them kind of, um, you know, prod them a little bit to work on care plans for um, people that are affected by this disease. So it's really about, you know, the quality of care for people that are diagnosed. We know there's not a cure, but we can, you know, hopefully in, in improve the quality of their lives, you know, while they're alive and, and putting together an effective care plan is part of that. So when you look at the Alzheimer's Association broadly, there's really three pieces to it. There's the obvious research one that, you know, that we always think about, and that's, you know, working with um, organizations. And the nice thing about um, the Alzheimer's Association, we are the largest nonprofit um, private uh, uh, organization that's devoted to Alzheimer's. So other than the federal government, we are the largest funder of research. Or, of research. The nice thing is, you know, federal gov government is, is restricted by, you know, within the boundaries of the U.S. government as far as finding research projects and, and funding for that. We can go anywhere. So anywhere that we see promising research around the world, um, we can fund that if it looks like something that, you know, that might be able to, you know, further our knowledge of, of the disease. So that's one piece of it. Um, the other piece is, is um, that a lot of people don't realize is that the Alzheimer's Association is, is heavily involved in caregiver support. Um, some of that is done through the, what we talked about with advocacy, but some of it's also then um, volunteer resources for support groups throughout the Bay Area, not just you know, where the offices are, but we, we have volunteers in all the different towns um, throughout the East Bay that uh, provide those support groups for people that are both living with Alzheimer's and, and the caregivers that, that care for them. And I think these are a real lifeline for, for our community. Um, and then the third piece of it really is promoting healthy, healthy brain, healthy, healthy living initiatives. And this is really around the, the area of, prevent, of prevention. So, you know, someone like you or me that, you know, are younger, we may not be showing signs of Alzheimer's yet, we don't know if it's developing in our brains yet. There's a lot of, of questions around that. So, you know, what can we do possibly to, um, you know, to stave off the disease, maybe, you know, push it further down the road and, and you know, help prevent, um, maybe prevent it from developing at all. So, you know, there's a lot of information that, that we provide and we promote around healthy living. And you've probably heard some of that stuff like Mediterranean diets, exercise, sleep, stress, and all those things. So... <laughs> Yeah, so the association is is very busy in promoting, you know, a lot of different initiatives, and and the, the volunteers are critical to, um, to all of those different missions because we really do run on a pretty small staff. Um, the walk that that we have in October, 
there's actually only one staff partner that works, that's paid, that works on that walk. Everybody else that you see working on that walk the day of and the entire planning committee is all volunteer driven, which um, I am extremely proud of. Um, I love our volunteers, they're like family. And, um, and we have a, a super great time year round um, putting on this walk. So that's just a little bit of an overview of the Alzheimer's Association, but there's tons of resources at alz.org where you can learn more about all the work that we're doing. Well, I'm in the support group here mm -hmm. in town. Fantastic. There's, I don't want to say unfortunately, but there's a lot of us regulars. And so we've kind of formed a little family and we help each other in and around the meetings, after the meetings. So that's great. And then the, when you were talking about the codes for Medicare, um, that's the HOPE Act. Yes. So you, you, yes, you've been keeping up on, on legislation. Very good. Yes. So the HOPE Act is, um, and, and th this act was actually passed, um, you know, a couple of years ago, but what we're, we're working on now is legislation to help, um, educate the uh, medical community because it's, it's mainly doctors. Um, we would like it for it to be also, um, nurse practitioners and others, but it's really only the doctors that can use the codes. So we're, you know, trying to get the word out on, on, you know, how to use those codes, when to use them. And hopefully that, you know, will, will push them, as I mentioned, to, you know, to, to, to really put, help them put together care plans. Because that's, that's one of the things that we see a lot is, you know, somebody gets a diagnosis from the doctor and then that's it. It's good luck with that. You're on your own, you know, kind of thing. So um, I, I say that and it sounds harsh and, and it really, when you look at the medical community around here, they're a lot further along, partly because we have Stanford and, and UCSF that, that are really leading the way when it comes to Alzheimer's research. So they understand the, the issues you know, that surround that beyond just the, the pathology of the disease. So, you know, that we're lucky here because then, you know, we have a lot of, of, um, of, of health centers, you know, like um, Kaiser and, uh, and John Muir that have been great partners with the Alzheimer's Association. And we work actually with them together in a partnership where, um, you know, they refer patients to us um, people that have been diagnosed to get um, to some of the resources that they may need that are throughout the community um, and, and help them put together that care plan. So it's a great um, symbiotic relationship that we're starting to develop. That's fantastic. Does yeah. Sutter Delta work with you guys? We're working on them. Mm, we're getting that's there. Who, that's who yeah. my mom is with. Yeah. And I'm getting a little tired of having to educate the doctors and the nurses. Is I would yeah. think when someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's and my mom is in the advanced stages, that that would be front and center on her chart so that they wouldn't do stupid things. <laughs> like we went to the lab to have blood drawn and the gal goes, okay, so can you tell me your first and last name and your date of birth? And I'm like, right. I barely understood that. And no, my mother can't tell you that because she forgot. Her, mm -hmm. That part of her brain is dead. She does not remember her birthday, how old she is, or the, it surprises me she doesn't remember her last name, but no, she doesn't remember that. And when people ask questions like that, she gets frustrated and right. um, not belligerent, but less cooperative. So right. it's kind of like, thank you. You've just made all of our lives harder today. You know, and it's like, and I always tell them, we had, to, we had her follow-up neurology appointment this week, and I go in, and I don't know why the neurologist is always behind, and we ended up there early, which, you know, with people like my mom, it's difficult to navigate and show up at the place at exactly the right time, mm -hmm. and so I just told them, we're here, I know we're early, and I know the doctor's usually late, and they said, yes, she's, you know, 15, 20 minutes late, which I found skeptical. And I said, well, mom doesn't wait patiently, so we're going across the parking lot to get something to drink. Because <laughs> the last time we were there, we waited an hour, and I finally had to sick my mom on the staff. Because I'm like, I, yeah. can't keep, I can't keep her entertained anymore, people. Running out of things to do here. <laughs> and they were great. I think maybe they remembered. I don't know. But I, I told, you know, we went across to the parking lot, which with her, that takes a few minutes and got something to drink and I was watching the clock and they called and said, oh yeah, actually the doctor's more like 30, 40 minutes behind schedule. I'm like, uh -huh, that's kind of what I figured when we first showed up. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of got to the end of the sitting around 
complimenting the restaurant stage of the day. And I thought, well, it's getting to be about that time. Mom is really slow. Her visual processing is shot. So we have, um, instead of curbs, we have curbs with, they're called bioswales. So they're, they're a complete hazard to everybody. But it's not something my mom can step into and up and out of. It's just, no. Mm -hmm. So we have to take the long way around things, which is really frustrating. So I thought, well, let's, let's head back over. And as we were going up the elevator, they called and said, okay, we're ready for you to come back. So that worked out perfectly. But I have had to tell every single person what her diagnosis is, how to talk to her, what not to say, what it's just like, could you guys like put this on? Maybe I should just make a, a photographed or no, you know, photocopied sheet and say, here, read there you this. Go. Well, yeah, and that's part of that's part of the reason for the legislation is is it, it it hopefully it builds some consistency across you know all these groups, and I'm I'm also really excited about um, you know what Governor Newsom is doing around you know the, the task force that he's put together with Maria Shriver. Um, we have some stellar people on that, and I think that you know that'll also help um, really kind of uh, uh, bring that consistency and bring some standards into the process. Um, that's one of the things that um, you know, that's part of the Healthy Brain Initiative is, is really treating this um, and, and putting it more in the sphere of public health, where before, you know, it's always been on the disease side, but it really is, should be an important part of public health, um, just like communicable diseases are, because of the fact that it's growing and, um, and it's becoming very costly. Oh, definitely. Yep. Which is part of the reason why we walk, is to uh, raise money then for, uh, to help with some of those costs. Well, this will be my first year and I'm working with a Rotarian who is also an Edward Jones. Um, oh, person. William. William. That's right. Yeah. I forgot you knew awesome. him. Yes. Um, I do need to talk to him. I need to make a note for Monday. Yeah. Tell him Ginny says hi. Okay. I'll say, Hey, I talked to Ginny. When are we going to get together? Get on that. Yes. Yeah, for real. Cause Lord, it's going to be October before we know it. And I'm going away for five days. Yes. The beginning of like in two weeks. So. Yeah. Gotta get gotta get on these things before <laughs> before it's Thanksgiving and we're like, what happened to October? <laughs> exactly. Yes. So how many years have you done the walk? I've actually done the walk. Um, the funny thing is, is I've never actually walked um, because I've always been working behind the scenes. The first year I um, that I actually uh, did the walk, it was um, in um, two thousand. It was actually in two thousand five or, or sorry, two thousand fifteen. I lost my mom um, in uh, Christmas. Day after Christmas 2014 and um, and it was when I lost my mom when I really decided to, to get to get active some people do it the other way where their parents are diagnosed and they get active and then and then or somebody dies you know or somebody in their you know family is diagnosed um, and then after they die they maybe sometimes fade away or have to leave for a while and then start to, to make their way back but I was one of those that didn't really get involved I always gave money but I didn't get involved until after mom died um, and the first thing I did was, because there is a table there when you go to the walk the day of, that has um, a bunch of people working on the advocacy side, and they have these cards that you sign, basically just your name, um, your name and your address as a citizen of the East Bay that goes into your respective senator and congress person, you know, saying, I support, you know, um, this cause and, and all of that. So it's, it's a great way to flood them with a whole bunch of names. They always like to see that. It's important to them so they can see that their constituents are, you know, are really um, advocating and interested. That was the first year. Um, and then I went to a, a kickoff party at following February where they were asking if people were interested in being on the planning committee, which is the, the group then that works year round to, uh, you know, to plan for that one day. And so I thought, yeah, I'll try to check it out. And somehow, <laughs> some way, I got roped into being co-chair that year. Oh, good Lord, so, your first year. <laughs> yeah. So um, we didn't have a chair. We just had the staff partner. But Owen Dean was wonderful and kind of, you know, teach me the ropes and kind of what all the different subcommittees are and the work that they do. And, you know, so it was just kind of um, learn by doing that year. And then um, the following year, I just stepped in as chair. So um, this is going to be my fourth year, third year as, as um, chair. And... Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely love it. I love the committee that we work with. They're incredible. The work that they do year round. We do everything. We do the, all the marketing activities. 
recruiting new people because you know there's always turnover when you have these walks um, we have people that work on retention to get people to come back um, we work have a team that works on sponsorships so you know all the companies that you see that show up their day of um, they're responsible for that um, we have another team that works on mission and that's really kind of to provide you know the the really the heart and soul of why we're there you know around the disease and and, and make it a you know a beautiful experience the day of and then of course logistics <laughs> that's the nuts and bolts that's what we're fully into right now um, it's all about logistics 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 this last month and you know everybody running around with with their pants on fire so it's fun <laughs> well I can relate we just are uh, one of our big fundraisers is this weekend mm. and it's it always seems like everything comes you, know, you think it's going to be a disaster and then somehow at the last hour it all gets pulled together and it all yeah. works out how's that work i yeah. have no idea that's the it's fundraising a... gods i guess yeah i understand it's... that the walk outgrew a fairly large city park last year yes so we've we've had the walk um this is actually the eighth year for the walk and um, up until then we were at heather farm in walnut creek um but if you've ever been to Heather Farm, you know, some of the challenges that we ran into was, um, you know, the meadow was pretty good size, but the problem with the meadow with all that grass and hillside is that it wasn't ADA compliant. And that really kind of bothered me because, you know, we have a lot of people that come, you know, from some of these senior centers that, you know, if, if they wanted to bring wheelchairs or anything, you know, to um, the site, it just wasn't workable. And we also had issues around parking we were having to shuttle people in from other parking lots around the area because there just wasn't enough parking there at the park. So yeah, it was getting a little big. Um, and uh, you, you, we, we realized that, you know, that that might be constricting our growth and it might also be adding to the day of experience for people where they may not be encouraged to come back because they'd be kind of like, eh, it was kind of hard to get to and parking. I had to park way back, you know, a mile away and they had to bus me in it. You know that's not what you want you know for an experience for something like this so you know when we looked at where we wanted to move it you know we thought of a lot of different things you know we were very conscientious about the fact that this grew organically as a, as a friends and family um, walk at, in Walnut Creek and we really wanted to make sure that we didn't inconvenience the Walnut Creek walkers too much obviously it was gonna they were gonna have to go a little bit further but by putting it where we did in San Ramon you know, we have it right there in Bishop Ranch, where when you come off of Bollinger Canyon or Crow Canyon, you just, you're pretty much right there. And it's really, the parking's going to be super easy because all the workers are out for the weekend. Yeah. So it's a business yeah. park for those people who yeah. don't live in the area. <laughs> yes, it is a business park. And it's right by the, the, the newly created city center with all sorts of wonderful places to eat and shop. And, you know, so we're really looking forward to it. The, the route is, is beautiful in that area. And, um, yeah, so really, you know, the biggest challenge for us is just, you know, we kind of know the things that we need to do day of, you know, it doesn't change. Um, but, you know, when it's a new environment, you just never know kind of what things might pop up. But we're really excited about, you know, having being in that location. There's a lot of partnerships we've already been able to build um, with some corporations that are in that area. And, you know, and that's really helpful to getting some of the corporate teams involved because, you know, there's as you know, this is kind of a hidden disease. It, it isolates people, you know, and when you get diagnosed, all of a sudden you, you, you draw in. And I really think that that, it, that causes problems as far as, you know, when you're talking about your, your care plan and, you know, and quality of life. So, you know, the more that we can get people involved in things like this, and especially a day like this, because, you know, if you're in the, in the middle of, you know, when I sat in on your, your caregiver group, you know, I highly recommend that everyone do that, you know, at some point, you know, sit in on a caregiver group because you, you do get the sense of just how isolating this disease and the day in, day out, 24 hours a day, you know, issues that, that you have to deal with. And on this one day, you get to come out, you know, and you get to see all these people that are fighting with you, you know, and, 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 it, and, and nobody is, you know, it, it's not a sad day. It's a hopeful day you know, where everybody's there fighting for the same thing. And when you see all those people fighting with you, it really does give you hope. And, you know, and, and I just wish I could share it with more people because I think when they come there, they get inspired, you know, and, and go, yeah, we can do this. We can beat this. So, you know, it's important to bring corporate teams on too, because there's, you know, it's, it's not so much the corporation, it's the people that are at that corporation. It's their workforce. You know, there's, there's people that are living 
you know, either either living with disease, this disease and they don't know it, they're not diagnosed, or they're caregiving and dealing with, you know, a parent or a loved one at home and then having to go to work every day and then coming right back home and being right back in that, you know, and, and so the more we can educate a lot of these, these corporations about, you know, the issues that people in their workforce dealing with Alzheimer's are having to deal with, it, it is eye-opening. I've seen, uh, I've seen jaws drop when we talk to HR people about, you know, this is what your workforce is dealing with, you know, if they're a caregiver. So, you know, that's been really important to us, too, is, is you know, educating you know, a lot of these companies because culture is a big thing for them you know, and providing a, you know, quality workplace. So, you know, we feel like this is something that, you know, that we can provide to them and, and help educate them on. Which is important because if they've never personally dealt with this issue, like my dad was diabetic and it wasn't overnight, but it felt overnight. And his memory went back to 1998. This was in 2016. Mm-hmm. And he would call and call and call and call until i finally just like to shut the phones off because i'm like you know he's all freaked out he doesn't know where he's at because he was in the hospital for 32 days he didn't know where his car was i mean it was just it was horrible and if he was calling me at a you know place of employment i work from home you know my husband's self-employed so it's a it was a little easier to deal with but you know if we were at an office i can see you know a supervisor or hr person being like what the yeah, hell? What's going on? Yeah. yeah, I get the hell off the phone. Why are they calling you 15 times in two hours? You know, it's right. like, I don't want them calling me either. Right. And then as you know, as I was mentioning earlier, I've been taking my mom to various um, ultrasound appointments and even the stupid doctor doesn't realize it's like a three hour process to drive over there. She's about 15 minutes away, coerce her into the car, get her to the appointment, do the appointment. It's just like, I can't just quote, go on my lunch hour and take a long lunch hour. Cause it's, it's half a day. And then after you've dealt with her, it's like, well, now my brain is fried. So I'm not doing anything else. Yeah. I, I actually think it's easier getting a toddler in inside in, in and out of a car than it is somebody that's dealing with Alzheimer's. It's yeah. That's because, right. because you do become more immobile. You know, there's, there's balance issues and things like that. Physical things that start to happen too, that, you know, that, that happened with aging also, but you know, you, when you put a brain disease on top of it, it becomes really problematic. Yeah. Like my mom follows behind me because as I mentioned, her visual processing is shot and I look like the SOB that doesn't let the little old lady catch up. But if I stop, she stops. If I yeah. slow down, she slows down. I mean, it's enough to make like, you just want to like bang your head on the nearest tree or car window. Like, ah. <laughs> and with a toddler, you know, you can pick them up. It might not be pleasant. Mm-hmm. You might be kicking and screaming and people might wonder if you're kidnapping them. Mm-hmm. But I can't pick up my mom. You right. know, that's, I mean, right. I could probably try, but it's probably not a wise idea. And with toddlers, you can kind of bribe them a little bit. With somebody with a brain disease, you can bribe them, but it's, you have to do it every two minutes. So yeah, yeah, exactly. And I get the, my mom doesn't remember that my dad's passed away. So whenever she figures out we're going to the doctor and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get smarter and just say, oh, hey, we got some, you know, thought you might want to go with me with, on these errands. And like I said, a little slow, but I'm getting smarter. <laughs> but she figures out where we're going. She starts like in on, well, why is my husband not taking me? What's wrong with him? And rare, 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 rare. What a lazy SOB. It's like, oh, Lord. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, yes, this, I, my dad was not a perfect person. The, this is not the reminiscing I would like to do with you, please. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and I've, I have learned because I used to say, well, remember he had eye surgery and he can't drive anymore. And the day that she looked at me and she said, oh, and she said, I'm saying BS because it's supposed to be a clean podcast. Mm-hmm. She used the full on phrase. And I thought, this is ridiculous. So I've learned to say, well, I don't know. You tell me. And then there you she go. shuts her up. Yeah, it she didn't have an two, answer. <laughs> yeah, it might take two or three of that comment sometimes when she's really riled up over his his lazy ineptitude Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) but yeah it's just it's and it's exhausting you know and you're stressed and you're tired because if they're in your home you might not be getting good enough sleep so it's very important i think for you know companies to realize you know well family leave might be nice but it's not enough my sister burned through hers yeah like self-employed people don't get it so yeah yeah. You know, it's, it's, 
that's one of the things I'm, I'm trying to get the doctor to understand is just because I work from home doesn't mean I can give up Friday afternoon and take mom, you know, 20 miles away for a, a test because mm -hmm. you think it's urgent and you yeah. know, they don't, they don't understand. They're like, well, well, what do you mean you can't do it? I'm like, I have things to do. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Well, and, and you, you know some of the numbers. I mean, when you start, um, you know, this does become a numbers game after a while. And, and you know, right now there's 5.8 million people living with Alzheimer's. Um, there's 16 million people that are caring uh, for people with, with Alzheimer's, you know, and these are working people. So, you know, there's a lot of unpaid hours, caregiver hours. And not only that, but there's a lot of dollars being spent, you know, um, Currently, this disease is costing us $290 billion in Medicare and Medicaid. That's a just Medic a year annually. That's just Medicare and Medicaid. That's not the dollars that, you know, that caregivers are paying out of pocket. So, you know, th th those are the, the numbers that we can quantify. And, and, you know, there's estimates that, you know, there's just millions and millions of, of hours of missed work and things like that, you know, that and, the, and that hits productivity for every company. So, the scary part is, you know, what we're projecting. If, if we don't have a way to treat this disease, slow it down, or any kind of, you know, effective um, care plan for it, then by 2050, we're, we're looking at 16 million Americans with this disease. Um, that's, that's over a trillion dollars mm. that's going to go from Medicaid and Medicare. Um, the estimate is, is one out of every four Medicaid and Medicare dollars is going to go just for this one disease. So, you know, that's part of the reason why we call it a public health crisis. You know, it, yes, it's not like something like Ebola that spreads like that, um, but it is a very complicated disease that, um, you know, that, that takes a lot of work to, you know, to, to learn. And we, you know, we're still trying to really understand the cause and how to, you know, how to detect it and those kinds of things. So as those costs really mount, you know, this is something that, you know, when you look at just the general costs of, of healthcare and how expensive it is, this one disease could collapse our healthcare system, you know, and, and that's not hyperbole. I mean, that's just based on, you know, the raw numbers that we're looking at today. So, you know, that's part of the reason for the urgency too in, in why we walk, you know, wherever we can get funding, you know, to um, apply those dollars towards research, you know, and, and towards um, um, caregiving and support. You know, those are important dollars. And, and, you know, the one thing I love about the Alzheimer's Association, since they do have very few people and it's, also, it's so volunteer driven, um, 78 cents of the dollar goes right into those, those services. So, you know, that's money well spent. You know, if, if you're someone that, that, you know, donates to the walk, you know, you can be rest assured that, you know, this isn't getting sucked up by staff and, and you know, expensive salaries. This is really going straight to, you know, support and research and all those important things. Which is I've, a big reason why I, I'm, you know, affiliated with this, um, this group. And people like to know that number. So 78 cents of every dollar. That's super excellent. Yeah. I don't yeah. think anybody gets better than Rotary. I think we're 98 cents of every dollar. That's insane. Yeah. Well, you know, some we of the don't pay anybody any. I think there's one staff person in charge of the foundation and the rest of it's all volunteers. Yeah. And some of the cost for us is, is putting on the walks. You know, there's there's a certain amount that 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 costs, obviously. So you have to put a little bit in to get a lot out, but it, you know, it's it's worth it, definitely. So, and I've met some of the people from the Northern California, Northern Nevada chapter, and none of these people have gone to work for the Alzheimer's Association because they thought they were gonna they were gonna make big dollar salaries. They've all gone into it because of a passion. I interviewed one young man. He he majored in policy in high, in college I'm talking about Zach. His, yes because of his grandmother's alzheimer's so i'm going to break the news on this podcast because he's sharing with everyone else he just got a promotion and he's going to be working um, with the national group awesome. in, in advancing public policy at the national level i'm joining ruth gay um, in her liaison office and um yeah he's he's uh, hit the big time and, and i couldn't <laughs> be more thrilled for him because he's just been amazing since he's joined um the associate we're going to miss him locally but um he's going to do great work so where is ruth's office well she um uh, you know usually an um, airbus 380 heading over you know the skies of she's she's really traveling everywhere her, her job is really to be the liaison to all the different chapters 
um, when it comes to, you know, the policies that were, that were, because there's a lot of things that happen, like California might come up with some really good public policy ideas for the state. And yet, um, right next door in Nevada, they don't know anything about it or Colorado or some, you know, so, you know, her job would be really to understand that all the different legislation that's, that's happening both at the state and federal level and, you know, and, and helping people understand where we have some synergies, you know, where, where some of these policies have been effective, you know, and helping share that then with, you know, with the other states around the country and that kind of thing. So just making sure those, you know, everybody's kind of communicating and, and you know, gets all that, all that data and information, you know, on what's going on in other parts of the country. So it's a big, big job, big job. And I think she's, um, she's in the air a lot. So, well, it sounds she, like he's going to have a good time. Uh, he, yeah, he's going to be fantastic. Yeah. So. I met him in February my first state advocacy day. And then we did a town hall in San Ramon, which is not technically in my district, but I cool. said, I'll come. Yeah. And the reason he ended up on the podcast is I asked him, how did you get involved with this? Cause you know, he, he was pretty, he still is pretty young. Mm -hmm. He's younger than my daughter, which made me feel kind of mm, a little old. <laughs> He's not a lot younger than her, but just enough. I was like, yikes, I could be your mother. It's like, oof. And, he started to tell me the story, but it was raining. And so I emailed him and said, we need to talk about this on the podcast because it's very inspiring. Mm -hmm. So he's been working on policy for Alzheimer's for about seven years, seven, since yeah. he was 17 and he just turned 25, 26. Yeah. He's, I think he's just old enough to uh, rent a car. <laughs> Lord, now you're making me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, that's the kind of people that go to work for the Alzheimer's Association, people yes. that are passionate about it. So yes. if you haven't checked out that episode, people, <laughs> it's called Honoring Grandmother. So tell me about the different colors of flowers, because, you know, thanks to the uh, tracking that the Google and those Facebook do on the internet, all I ever see is walk advertisement. <laughs> And all the flowers, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so we do hand out what we call promise flowers um, at the walk. Um, so everybody gets a promise flower and they can pick which one um, best fits, um, you know, why they're there. Um, the purple flower is for people that have lost someone to Alzheimer's. Um, the blue flower is actually people that have Alzheimer's. And then we have a yellow flower and that's for caregivers. So sometimes you can have, you know, you can be a couple, but we usually have people just grab one, you know, flower that's, that's you know, their story right now. And then the orange flowers is just for people that support the cause. So we have a lot of people that come out that, you know, don't have any, um, you know, don't have anyone close to them, but maybe they'd have a friend or, or they just, they understand this disease and, you know, they want to do something. As a matter of fact, our logistics chair, um, she has absolutely zero um, association with Alzheimer's and she does unbelievable work for the Alzheimer's association because she, you know, this disease is, is, you know, she just feels very empathetic to people that, you know, go through this and, you know, it's important to her. And, and I think she also sees that this is a public risk for everybody. So even though it's not in her family, doesn't mean it isn't going to pop into her family because this is, this is a non-discriminating disease. So, you know, while yes, it does tend to run in the family, it, it, there are a lot of folks that, um, you know, that have never had Alzheimer's in the family and then, and then their aunt or uncle or, you know, one of those ends up, ends up getting it. So, um, yeah, unfortunately. So that's what's, and so it, it's a beautiful day because you have all of these different, you know, flowers throughout the, uh, you know, throughout the crowd. And we expect um, to have, um, you know, at least 2,500 people there. We're, we're shooting for a little bit more. So lots of people there holding those flowers. And, and, you know, we have a ceremony then where we honor, you know, all of those different, um, those flowers. And um, yeah, it's, it's pretty, um, it's pretty profound. And, and um, sometimes a few tears are shed during that, that ceremony, but, uh, but, but it's, but like I said, it's a very uplifting day. So you have to experience it because it's great. And um, you got to start a team and just do a little fundraising. It doesn't take much. I send emails out and, and, um, and then hit Facebook and I get a lot of donations just through those two, those two areas. So, and, and we, we have all sorts of different fundraisers that people do throughout the year, you know, whether it's, you know, soul cycle or bake sales or golf tournaments or, or even just give back nights. There's tons of restaurants that do give back nights. 
you know, where, you know, you set it up with them in advance, you advertise it out to your community and then people come and, you know, they bring the flyer for that night and say, yeah, I want my meal, you know, to be part of the give back. And then, you know, they'll give proceeds for that night to, um, to your team for your walk. So, you know, lots of different ways you could, you can fundraise. Well, I'm going to have to get going on that, I think. So how far is the walk? I've, I'm signed up to go and I don't even know how far it is. Yes. Well, there's two routes. And they're very flat, so that's the good news. You know, I'm, I'm one of those I like to climb. I'm a hiker, so, um, I, you know, I, I would be happy with, you know, something goes something like that. But um, <laughs> they're very flat, which is great, so everybody can do them. Um, there is a one-mile and a three-mile route, and they just kind of loop around and come back to where, to where you start, basically. So pretty easy to do, and it's just a walk. It's not a race or a run or anything like that. It's just a nice, nice um, – flat even stroll for one or three miles and people, people bring dogs are we there? oh yeah okay oh yeah dogs are our dogs are welcome kids are welcome stomper's going to be there um that day so if you're an A's fan which i am and i'm going to make sure i get my picture with stomper while he's there so um you know we've got a kid's corner we've, we've got special areas that are set up for our grand champions who are our top fundraisers uh, we got music. It's just, you know, we've, we've got, you know, we've got sprouts there. It usually provides, you know, a little something to eat, whether it's bananas or oranges or, you know, something to get you going, get that energy for that, for that three mile walk. So it's a good time. <laughs> I'm a cyclist. So I'm used to about every 15 miles, you get a rest stop with snacks. Yeah. yeah. Not, not one or three. That's definitely <laughs> nothing. And I walk my dogs about that far. Not Perfect. generally. Well, no, we have a three mile loop around the neighborhood. Yeah. So I might bring Perfect. my, might bring my monsters, although somebody else will have to come with me because I do have three. It's oh, a little hard to. That is tough. Yeah. Well, yeah one, that... one of, one of them is almost 12 and he wears shoes on his back feet because of his arthritis. So mm. he goes, um, free range is what I call it. He doesn't need a leash. The other two need leashes because they will greet everybody and anybody that comes near them or yeah remotely well, near them <laughs> and we do recommend leashes just because of it it's quite the crowd and there's other yeah dogs. we don't know how other dogs will react so um, we do require leashes but other than that um, all dogs are welcome all people are welcome all shapes and sizes and and um and yeah and if and if you are able to fundraise a um, hundred dollars then you will get a t-shirt so that's a little incentive, just a small incentive to get um, $100. Pretty easy goal to get to. Most people get to that pretty easily if they, you know, just put a little link on Facebook or something like that or send an email out to some friends. Um, yeah, and then, um, and then the day of, well, so the link to go to, I probably should give you some of the, some of the um, actual details, right? That so, would help. <laughs> yes. So if you go to, um, if you go to um, act.alz.org, slash East Bay 2019. That is the link for the, uh, for the walk itself, just specifically for our East Bay walk. And from there, um, there's a button there to, um, to start a team, um, to register or join a team. There's one already that you want to join that, that you know of. And then from there, it's really easy to fundraise. There's a wealth of information then on your page. Um, there's photos you can upload of your loved ones that, you know, that maybe are dealing with this disease or you've lost to the disease, places where you can kind of write your own personal story, which I always recommend because um, the personal stories really do draw out um, the donations from people because they're like, wow, that's, yeah, that's something. So, yeah, and just a ton of resources on how to, you know, to link it to Facebook and Twitter and, you know, all those resources because we all love to tweet. So. <laughs> that's true. Yes. So now does all of the different chapters have walks about the same time of year? Or they all yeah, sort of actually we're in walk season right now. It's kicked into high gear right after Labor Day. We start every weekend. You'll find a walk both on Saturdays and Sundays. There's, there's actually 600, over 630 walks throughout the country, which seems like a lot. But, you know, when you think about it, I, you know, East Bay, I mean, we have, well, in the Bay Area, we have seven walks. Um, we've got a couple really big ones, million dollar walks in, um, San Jose and, and, uh, San Francisco, Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, and then we have East Bay, which we're working to get to that billion dollar or that million dollar walk. Um, 
you know, that's kind of been our goal for the last few years is to, is to grow it to the point where we're the third million dollar walk. And I think we can because we're in the East Bay um, and we're the only walk in the East Bay. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to grow, you know, to get more people involved. Um, you know, especially when you consider, you know, we, we had about 2,500 last year. So, um, you know, I think we can get over 3,000. I think we can get to 5,000. I think we can easily be a million dollar walk, you know, as, as the awareness really starts to grow. So we really serve um, all of Contra Costa and Alameda County. So that's a big geographic area, but 630 walks across the country. And we were actually the 25th um, largest walk last year. So we want to get bigger. Um, but to stay in that, that group is really hard. There's a, there's a group of top 30, which is like the top 5% uh, walks in the country. And to stay in that group of 30 is, is pretty competitive, um, which I like that. I love the fact that people do feel competitive when they're doing this fundraising because it's for such a good cause. And so even though we are competitive, we all high five each other when they do really well and they meet their goals that they've set for the walk. Um, we set a goal of 650. 55,000, I think it is, or 650,000 um, um, total revenue for the walk. And um, we're close to 50% right now. So I kind of like where we're at because, you know, usually most people, they don't really kick in with their fundraising until right about now where we're starting to see more start to. Right now when you go, ah, it's in a month. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Which is why we're pushing really hard now to get people going because, it, it comes by really, it comes really fast. So we, we like to encourage people to get started now because, you know, if you wait, it, it can slip by you really quickly. And, and, you know, I, I know people that have, have really felt bad that, you know, they had every intention of getting going and then they let it slip and then they're like, yeah, and then they miss the boat and then, you know, they're very unhappy. So we don't want any unhappy people. That sounds, sounds I'm, I'm excited to go. And I'm excited for your first time. I love the first timers because it's always, you know, they're like, they're like, wow, this is so awesome. So, yeah. Well, and also being a photographer and obviously an online persona, I can mm -hmm. probably live stream a lot of it. I just did a, a live podcast at a senior resources event here in town earlier today. I have no idea how that's going to sound because, you know, wasn't something I could practice and it was, right. the room was loud, but it might be fun to, I have to find, figure out a way of doing something along those lines while we're there. Cause I think that'd be fun. Yeah, that would be awesome. And, and you know, if, if you're really interested in doing that, I can hook you up with our logistics chair and she can kind of help you out as far as where, you know, where might be the best place to locate yourself for different parts, you know, of, of the day, you know, because I know the ceremony itself, you probably will want to live stream and, you know, probably somewhere near the stage would be a good place. And I have seen people that have recorded it. And they stand sort of up front and do the, you know, the recording. You can either record the stage or you can turn and, and record the crowd, you know, when they're doing the, the flower piece of it. But, um, but yeah, we can, we can certainly accommodate. We ac accommodate anyone that wants to do video or photography. Um, we've got Paul Deano, the, the uh, weatherman from um, CBS5, emceeing the event. So that always is great because he, uh, he's kind of a natural on stage. So that's good. So, yeah, it's a good time. It'll be fun. Well, definitely hook me up with the logistics person. I yep. have lots of uh, camera and and streaming toys, so um, I just nice. got a gimbal. So I think oh, yay. I'll practice with that some more, and yeah, that'll be fun. I yes. don't know. I don't know. Somebody's gonna have to come with me to handle the dogs, so I can handle all the all the uh, recording there you toys. Go. Recruit some team members. Have William take those dogs. Well, as, that's true. I'm going to have to go bug him at Rotary on Monday. There you go. Oh, speaking of Rotary, I want to mention that real quick. So we did um, start a pilot program this year with the Rotary. And um, if you go to um, alz.org slash Rotarian Action Group, you will see that page. And um, that is where the Rotaries can actually sign up for the walk. And when they sign up and, and they actually sign up with their rotary name, like we had Livermore, they were the first one in the East Bay to sign up. They are killing it. They are, they are number three in the country. Awesome. Yep. And um, so that's, they've kind of issued a, a challenge, a throwdown, so to speak, for um, all the other rotaries in the East Bay. Um, I think we're getting Danville signed up now. And, uh, you know, we hope to maybe, you know, get a few more and, 
you know, it's kind of baby steps. This is a pilot program. We're starting it this year, you know, hoping a few will get on and, and see how fun it is. And, and then, you know, as next year rolls around, we'll get a few more, you know, maybe they'll come to us and say, Hey, I heard about that thing last year and I'm not wanting to get in on that. So we'd be happy to have all of them. Well, since hubby is working on the district level, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'll, I will, and I know the district governor, because Danville and Livermore are not technically in our district. Ah, like we okay. go from San Ramon to Weed. In case anybody wants to know where Weed, California is, it's just slightly below the Oregon border. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, so you yeah. go to north. Okay. There's 73 clubs in District 5160, which <laughs> is my district. And I'm 99% wow. certain that Livermore and Danville are not in 5160. They're probably in the one that encompasses... Um, San Jose, which has a huge club of like 400 people. Wow. San Francisco has a huge club too. So but well, we'll work I'm, on 5160. We'll get them going. There you go. I'm, I'm, I'm just thrilled with, you know, the ones that have signed up so far, especially just across the country. When you look at the, you know, rotaries that have started to participate, I think, I think it's just gaining steam. I think that, you know, and, and obviously, I mean, you know this cause you're in rotary. I mean, I always ask this when I present, I, I ask for a show of hands of people that have been affected by this disease and um you know and i easily see you know half the hands go up so you know this isn't something that you know when you look i mean and, and this is across the board I mean, it's just not rotary you know any group that i go to if i ask you know about half the hands go up so you know this isn't something that you know is just um you know this thing that's sitting over here that you know people haven't really heard much about i mean it's it's it really has impacted a lot of people and you don't really you don't really know because no one talks about it. And I think sometimes it's shocking because people will raise their hand and then they'll look around the room and they're like, wow, I never even talked to these people about this, you know? Well, if it doesn't affect you or your family, it might mm -hmm. affect your neighbors, which could affect you. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a good neighbor, and I just talked to a gal yesterday about what to do when caregivers don't ask for help and recruiting friends, family, you know, people from your church group or your rotary group or whatever to, to step in and help with little bits here and there. I mean, if we don't slow down the growth of this disease, which so far we're not having any success on that, it's going to affect everybody in one way or another. That's it's right. either going to be your employees got, you know, a parent that's dealing with it and, or, you know, your family member or your neighbor. So we all Absolutely. should just join in and and do what we can because it's a really ugly disease. There you go. It takes a village. It does. Well, this is exciting. I'm looking forward to actually seeing you again in person in like a month. Yes, that would be fantastic. Just look for me, you know, running around with my hair on fire by the <laughs> stage. That's where I'll be trying to get people lined up, the speakers lined up and all that. So it'll be, well, it'll be awesome. I'm looking forward to it. And like, I will harass William on Monday and there you go. And, uh, get my, Get my, I haven't harassed the neighbors for donations to Rotary stuff for months, so. There you go. They, they think I forgot them, but I was just. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All righty. Well, you have a fantastic evening, and thank you for helping me spread the word about the walk and the importance of it. I truly appreciate it, and thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. You're welcome. Have a good one. Well, you've made it to the end of yet another episode. I hope that you really enjoyed it. Also, be sure to follow me on social media if you're not already. Facebook is Fady Memories Podcast. Instagram is at Alzheimer's Podcast. I hope you guys check me out, and I look forward to seeing you online. And as always, I'll be in your ears again next Tuesday.